for my talk, 45 years of learning about India and learning from India. My love affair with India all began in 1960. In 1860, the government of the United Kingdom had enacted the, first, the world's first food and drug regulations. And so in 1960, the United Kingdom government decided it was time to have a centennial celebration. So they convened a large meeting in London, to which I was invited, which included a very big conference on food safety and food availability. One of the principal speakers was an old friend of mine, Dr. Norman Wright, who at that time was the Deputy Director General of FAO. And he came, knowing I was going to be there, he came with a message from a very distinguished Indian, Dr. B. R. Sen, who had formerly been a very senior person in the Indian Civil Service, who was then the Director General of FAO. Dr. Sen has sent the message that he was about to launch, or is in the progress of launching, a worldwide freedom from hunger campaign. Now, this was the first occasion when there had been any international attention given to world hunger and to world malnutrition. But it was typical of Dr. Sen, who was a very brilliant man and a very, became a very dear friend, that he would launch this because he was deeply concerned about malnutrition and about world poverty and world hunger. Specifically, he asked if I could come back and persuade Canadians to support the Freedom from Hunger campaign in principle, but specifically a training program which was to be established at Mysore in South India. FAO had spent about a year looking at the availability and the condition of food supply throughout Asia. And they discovered that, that, that despite the enormous losses of particularly perishable foods in a very hot tropical climate, nowhere in the whole of Asia was there any facility, any university, any college, not even in Japan, where Asian men and women could be taught the basic principles and practices of food preservation and food protection. I was then director of research of Canada's largest agribusiness company, a company called Maple Leaf Mills, which no longer exists and has nothing whatever to do with the Maple Leaf Foods, which has been <laughs> causing so much trouble and uh, with hysteria. Uh, but however, uh, that be as it may, it was then the largest business, uh, the largest agribusiness company in Canada. And Dr. Sen's idea was that perhaps I could mobilize the Canadian food industries and the labor industries to give support to this program of training Asian men and women in how to preserve much of the food and therefore to reduce the enormous losses that were taking place. When I came back to Canada from London, I discovered that Canada was in the process of setting up the Freedom from Hunger Committee, and they had appointed a, a, a man I knew very well, who later became a very close friend, Mitchell Sharp, as the president, as the chairman of the Freedom from Hunger Committee. Those of you who are old enough will recall that until the mid-1950s, Mitchell Sharp had been the, uh, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Deputy Minister of Industry, Trade and Commerce. At that time, he had left, he left the government when the Diefenbaker government came in, and he was Vice President of, Brazil, of a company called Brazilian Power and Traction in Toronto. We had met several times, and I knew him fairly well. So I took this proposal from Dr. Sen to Mitchell Sharp and said, what did he think about this? And he uh, said, well, we haven't really set up any program at all. We don't have a project. I'll present this to the few members of my committee. 
And uh, so he did and came back to me and said, yes, they would like to adopt this, what became known as the Canada Mysore Project, as Canada's contribution to the World Freedom from Hunger campaign on the condition that you run it. Well, I had never raised money for anything other than my own needs in my life before. But anyway, I, I, I said, fine, well, I, I, I will, and they asked me to join the Freedom from Hunger Committee. The specific objective was to set up a training facility where Asian men and, where men and women from all across Asia could be trained in how methods and principles of food preservation and food protection. The government of India had agreed to provide the facilities, but those of you who will remember the 1960s, the early 1960s, India was a very poor country. And India couldn't possibly provide the money that was required to bring men and women from all across Asia to Mysore to be trained. And so they looked to us, particularly to Canada, for this financial support. And they have chosen us, I think, because as you may or may not know, FAO was created in Canada. It was created in Quebec City in 1945 by a committee of the United, uh, which was eventually a committee of the United Nations, which was chaired by Lester Pearson, who was then a, a, a public servant in the Department of Foreign Affairs. Well, as a, re a result of this uh, essentially nomination to become the chairman of the Canada Freedom, Canada Mysore project, I made a long visit to India. There I met the Maharaja of Mysore, who later became a very good friend, and learned that he had offered to give one of his palaces to be the, the headquarters, the facility for this international training center. The Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research in Delhi, Dr. Aziz Hussain, whom I got to know very well, had agreed that the staff of the Central Food Technological Research Institute in Mysore would provide the technical guidance and the local lectures. Some of our money would have to be used to bring lectures from outside. Those of you who recall your Indian history, and from, certainly from the time India became independent, will remember that uh, Prime Minister Nehru, one of his first acts, one of his first speeches stated the importance of this new India becoming fully cognizant and highly professional in the various technologies of that supported industry. And so the Central Food Technological Research Institute was just one of 40 institutes that Prime Minister Nehru set up in order to support and encourage industrial growth in India. While I was in India, I took over 200 transparencies. I don't think transparencies are taken anymore. I think they disappeared from the photographic art. In those days, uh, transparencies were the only way you took pictures. And I took over 200 in rural areas to illustrate rural poverty and also to illustrate the various aspects of food spoilage and why this project was so urgently needed. At that time, Food processing industries in India were really very rudimentary. Um, in the whole state of what was then the state of Mysore, which is now of course the state of Karnataka, there were less than 10 food processing industries. And uh, when you had marmalade at breakfast, it was rather like a high polymer that you would use to make a football or a baseball now. <laughs> and those of you who've been to India recently will have noticed the tremendous scope, tremendous progress that has been made. Indian food industries now produce products which are equivalent to certainly anything that you can buy 
in, in, in the supermarket here. The company I worked for, Maple Leaf Mills, had factories and sales outlets all across Canada. We were, one of our subsidiaries was Canada Bread, which was the longest chain of bakeries in the world. It extended all the way from Newfoundland to Vancouver Island. And so every year I was required to travel across the country. Uh, and while I was traveling on behalf of the company, I was able to meet with people and persuade them that they should become supporters of the Canada Mysore project. And by this, in this way, I was able to set up fundraising and promotional committees in every part of Canada. One of the most effective was, not because my wife from there, but uh, was from Saskatchewan, uh, where Mrs. Milligan, who is the grandmother of Peter Milligan, who is now the Speaker of the House of Commons, was, I would say, one of the most effective fundraisers. At that time, Saskatchewan had a Liberal government. And she had a tea party at her home, and she had the Premier, and she had most of the cabinet, and a whole lot of very other influential Saskatchewan people present. When she spoke, people listened, and when she said, you come, they came. There was no question about it at all. And I discussed this with Peter Milliken subsequently. Anyway, she was the chairman of our Saskatchewan committee, which was typical of committees that were set up all the way across the country. <coughs> and they provided speakers' panels, and I should have mentioned that when I came back, out of the 200 transparencies, my friends at Kodak in Toronto, which was then a food supply company as well as being a photographic company, they chose what they considered were the 40 best <coughs> transparencies. And they duplicated that in many, many copies. They made about 100 different sets of these. And I wrote notes for each of them, which were then able to be used by speakers all across the country. I also, because of my connection in the food industry, as we supplied many other food companies, I was able to persuade the company executive, the chief executives, the presidents, of Canada's largest, 20 largest food and agribusiness companies <coughs> to become my industrial fundraisers. Through one of these gentlemen, a, a man who passed on to uh, 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 some years ago, uh, who was the president of Lipton's, we were able to bring in, he said, if you get in one bank, you'll get them all, because the banks, the Canadian banks are just like sheep. <laughs> <laughs> you get a captive sheep and that, 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 that just drags in all the rest. So we saw, we got the president of uh, Toronto Dominion to commit funds to this, and immediately all the other banks came in. We also were able to persuade the United Nations Association, several NGOs, including the Canadian Save the Children Fund, a great many university and high school students. My principal fundraiser out west was Pat Booney, who was uh, well known, I think, for his uh, continued interest in world agriculture. And an old friend of mine, uh, retired Admiral Bad, Pat Bunch, who's been a senior admiral in the Canadian Navy, when he retired, became the director of the Canadian Naval Academy, Canadian Naval Cadets. And he volunteered all of their services, and he also persuaded the director of the Army Cadets and of the Air Force Cadets that they too should join. Well, we were able to buy all-point pens through our industrial contacts that are less than five cents each. And these cadets sold them from house to house for 25 cents each, and that's how we raised a great deal of money. The Prime Minister, Mr. Pearson, and all the leaders of the national political parties agreed to become honorary patrons. Mr. Pearson went and bullied them all, and they all agreed to join. Then Canada's 
many of you will remember Johnny Wayne and Frank Schuster as uh, Canada's two most eminent entertainers. And we got to know them quite well, and they agreed to become honorary vice chairman uh, alongside me. And they made 30 second advertisements that were broadcast by the CBC and all, a great many other stations across the country. Another of our very bright and imaginative uh, supporters designed what they call the share a loaf car. Now this will shock our young people because in those days a loaf of bread cost about 25 cents. It costs a good deal more now as every lady in this room will know. But it cost about 25 cents. And this person designed a card which had slots which would take in 20 quarters. And when people had a festive meal, or if they wanted to do it every time they had a main meal, they were, ex they were asked to put a quarter into this card. We were able to persuade the president of the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce that every one of his branches would receive these cards and would credit the $20 to our account. And so we raised the first $75,000 for this Canada Mice project out of selling ballpoint pens, <coughs> out of uh, share of cards. And while I was in India for the first visit, it was the time of the Dasara. And the Maharaja invited me to the Dasara and gave me the seat of honor right below the peacock throne. I don't know if any of you have been to the Dasara in my store, but if you have, you remember he sat on the peacock throne and the ceremonial elephant came down and bowed and then blew rose petals all the time. Well, we, one of our groups in the fundraising group in Oakville had a, quite a famous Canadian sculptor. And she designed a full-size elephant out of papier mache And they held, I described them what a dasra was like, and they held a dasara which raised an enormous amount of money for the program. And this was just one of the many ways that uh, Canadians came together and imaginatively raised money to relieve the immense amount of food loss that was taking place across Asia. And so between 1961 and 1965, we had raised practically $350,000. That today, if we've got any mathematical wizards amongst us, we <coughs> made about $5 million, given the, uh, the, the, the rate of, uh, of inflation. And because my industry group provided a free secretariat, we raised that money at less than a quarter of 1% of the total that we raised. Nobody has ever achieved that level of success and that level of administrative cost in raising money. My good friend, the Maharaja of Mysore, who was going to come to stay with us over here, phoned me one day and said, oh, I'm sending to you as a gift a baby elephant, which Air India is going to fly to Toronto. So, my wife and I said, well, what are we going to do with this baby elephant? If we put it in the back garden during the winter, the poor thing will get chill blades. So anyway, we talked to uh, General Chaudhary, who was the uh, High Commissioner and the former Chief of General Staff of India, and he at that time was the Indian High Commissioner here in, in Ottawa. And he said, oh, well, uh, I'll present it for you, but you better find a zoological garden that's prepared to take it, because he said, the last time we presented a baby elephant in an open space, it went right, it smelled fresh vegetables in a local supermarket, and it got $4,000 worth of damage in about five minutes. So we, I talked to the curator of the zoo at Wasega, which is north of Toronto, and they agreed to take little Indra and provide a nice home for her. Well, the money that we raised during these early years supported the, what we was, came to be known as the International Food Technology Training Center during its first eight years. 
and brought students from all over in Asia um, for short courses. The first short course began in 1963. The first two-year course began in 1965. Another contact I made while I was visiting India and who became another very close friend was the vice chancellor of the University of Mysore. And he agreed that anybody who completed a two-year course would receive a master's degree from the University of Mysore. So this became a strong incentive for people to come. The first MSc course had people from Japan, it had people from Thailand, it had people from what is now Myanmar, it had people from Pakistan, it had people from Sri Lanka, from Singapore, from Hong Kong, from India, and, uh, 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 and uh, obviously. And these people, many of them went back to become quite distinguished food scientists and food technologists. Many of them became deans in their universities. Three of them became head of national food development agencies in our own country. One from Singapore, one from uh, Sri Lanka, and another one from, uh, from Hong Kong. And the present director of the Central Food Technological Research Institute is himself an MSc graduate of the International Training Center. So it has had a cumulative effect so that by, 19, uh, by 1982, no, I think about it, by 1989, the center had trained over 8,000 8, men and women from nearly 50 developing countries because it's expanded beyond Asia to include North Africa and then to include the Middle East, North Africa, and, and Africa, South of the Sahara. So it has had a tremendous effect upon the growth of food industries. And just for your information, food processing is now the fastest growing India, growing industry in India. And also in Malaysia, also in many in Pakistan and many other developing countries of, of, of the region. In 1989, after I left IDRC, I was invited to become visiting professor at the International Food Technology Training Center, where I visit twice every year and lecture on food systems analysis and on food industry management. But this has also enabled me to work very much more closely with a lot of very poor rural people in Karnataka, in Tamil Nadu, and in Pondicherry, and more recently in, in Kerala. Because the main purpose of what I've tried to do, what I have not done, but what I've been able to work with my Indian colleagues to do, is to provide employment for poor people. Because, uh, as was said in the introduction you got, I am a great admirer of Mahatma Gandhi. In fact, I think you might say I'm one of his disciples. And you may recall that he said that poverty inevitably results from lack of stable employment. And therefore, to eliminate poverty, you have to provide employment for people, no matter what their level of education. And just because a person hasn't been to university, it doesn't mean they're stupid. Just they haven't been to high school doesn't mean that they can't learn. My grandparents left school when they were 11 years of age. They had to live very useful lives. And as I'll mention in a few moments, we have been able to train women who, by Canadian standards, would be judged as illiterate to run very, very successful small-scale agriculture, horticulture, and small-scale food processing. Because I think women, um, I, I, I make no apologies to the gentlemen present, because in my experience, and in, I've worked in 45 different, 85 different countries of, of, of the developing world, women are much more prudent managers of money and small business than are men. 
I mean, they've had women running these American banks. They wouldn't be in the mess that they are in. <laughs> well, then, in 1966, uh, Dr. B.R. Sen decided he was going to set up a new division of food and agricultural industries, and he invited me to be the director. Unfortunately, he didn't inform me that he might not be re-elected in 1967. So I went to FAO and worked for the RCN for a while, but then the new director general was a Netherlander by the name of Burma, who really had very few qualifications to be a director general, certainly not, nothing comparable to, 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 to the RCN's. His main interests were getting himself re-elected and finding jobs for his close friends. <laughs> FAO has had three outstanding directors general. The first one, Sir John Boyd Orr, the second, Dr. B.R. Sen, and the third, the present incumbent, Jacques Duf, who comes from Senegal. They have been unquestionably the most imaginative and most creative and most constructive because every one of them cared about the poor. They cared about the people they were trying to serve. And I think that that is the very essence of any development, be it economic, social, or technical, that you have to care about the people that are working forward with you and care about those you are trying to help. Anyway, while I was deputy director, I, I, uh, Dr. Sen, because there was no other position available, he made me deputy director of nutrition at FAO. And in that position, I was able to give some modest help to India. In 1967, for example, in cooperation with UNICEF, we formulated the first Indian national nutrition plan. A great many young Indians were at that time suffering from Pashyoko, which many of you will know about is uh, a, 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 a protein deficiency. And so we were able to persuade a good many of the larger Indian pharmaceutical and food corporations to set up what we call what was called the Industrial Protein Foods Association. This was to increase the amount of protein, cheap protein, edible protein, not the stuff like the Chinese are putting into baby food at the moment, but um, good protein into infant weaning foods. We are also able to help the Central Food Technological Research Institute to develop a very low cost weaning food. I think it cost about two paisa or a quarter of a kilo at the time. And this was made entirely from Indian raw materials. Unfortunately, very soon after this was launched, and the government of Kerala was the one that was using it most widely, the United States discovered it had a surplus of milk, which it converted to milk powder. And so it dumped this stuff free onto all of India, particularly onto Kerala, and, and, and to all intents and purposes, we have killed this local, locally developed, locally manufactured, made of local materials, weaning food. This illustrated to me at the time something which I talked about in the book that I had given to uh, Dr. Agrawal. Uh, the futility and the stupidity of most bilateral food aid programs, which exist only to dump the surpluses that exist in the donor country onto the poor, whether they need them or want them or not. Food aid is far more efficiently administered through the World Food Program, which incidentally was another of B.R. Sen's innovations. It was he who decided that the world needed a world food program. And so 
This was another of the lessons I learned through going to India about how to administer food aid to those who are badly needing it. In 1966, the World Bank decided that international development programs, particularly those administered by the United Nations agencies, had gone on so long that they should take a serious look at how well they were doing. And so they decided they would set up a series of commissions. The first one was to be at what was chaired by um, Lester B. Pearson, who had then re just retired from being Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, I have reviewed all of the recommendations of the Pearson Commission and of the Billy Brandt Commission, who Billy Brandt, as you know, is uh, the Chancellor in Germany. And uh, 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 Harvard Go Brunton Commission, each of which followed 10 years after the, uh, the Pearson Commission. I reviewed them all, and it's interesting how few of them have really, though they were very sensible, have been actually implemented by our aid agencies. But whilst he was doing this study, Mr. Pearson became immensely impressed with the work of the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations, and came back and said, well, since there's no Canadian company that's prepared to create anything comparable to the Ford and Rockefeller Foundation, the government of Canada will do it. And he persuaded Pierre Trudeau that Canada should create what became the International Development Research Centre. Now, not just because I worked for IDRC, but I'm simply stating facts. IDRC is internationally new, internationally unique. In that, its legal personality, that is, those who run it, are its board of governors. And the constitution of IDRC states that 11 of those will be Canadian, including the chairman. 10 will be foreigners. And in his opening speech, when he launched IDRC, Mr. Pearson said, and remember, he'd been professor of history in, in Manitoba before he came into the public service. So he knew his history. He stated, this is the first time in the history of the world that any government has entrusted the expenditure of its taxpayers' money to a bunch of foreigners. Because there were 10 non-Canadians who decided exactly what would be the policies and how IDRC would operate. During its first 20 years, there was always an Indian, a senior Indian, on the board. The first one was Anthony Dias, who had been the, food minister, the Secretary of the Food Ministry when we set up the International Training Center. The second was Professor Jalarati Nayodama, uh, who was uh, also another very, very dear friend. And the third was Professor M.G.K. Menon. All three, as I say, became very, very close friends of both my wife and myself. We knew them and their wives very well indeed. As I mentioned, Tony Dias, being Secretary of the Food Ministry, he later became Governor of West Bengal. Jalabhati Nayadama was my senior scientific advisor when I was at FAO, and uh, when Tony Dias decided to resign from IDR's free seas board, I recommended to the chair that uh, they replace him with Professor Nayadama. Professor Menon, we became very closely associated with one another. He had been Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. But we became friends when he was uh, <coughs> president of the International Council of Scientific Unions. And for 15 years, I was chair of the International Commission on the Application of Science to Food, to Forestry, and Agriculture. In 1970, I resigned from FAO, and I was appointed as scientific advisor to Bhutan, who was then 
Secretary General of the United Nations in New York. My specific purpose was to write his policy speech for the United Nations on the state of world nutrition and food security with special concern for India and Asia because at that time all of Asia and India was very poor. There was massive malnutrition throughout the region. In 1970, in September, I was invited by Mr. Pearson and Mr. Sharp, who was then the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to join this newly created International Development Research Center. First of all, as Director of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Sciences, and then later, as was mentioned, I became Vice President for all of research. Mr. Pearson was the first chair. He was my boss, and I, I can't speak too highly of him. He, he too was a disciple of Mahatma Gandhi. He believed in Gandhian principles, and I think if you look at this period as Prime Minister, we were a much more enlightened nation in relation to the rest of the world than we are today. Anyway, that, that, that having been said, uh, whilst Mr. Pearson decided that particularly the 10 Canadians on the board, many of whom didn't even know where India was, I don't think, uh, it was about time they learned something about the rest of the world. So he arranged that there would be one board meeting in Canada and one board meeting overseas every year. And the first meeting, which he arranged with Madame Pandit, who was a great friend of his, would be in Delhi. Well, while we were in Delhi, Tony Dias, who was just a member of the board, said, Joe, you should meet a very distinguished agricultural scientist, Dr. N. S. Swaminathan. Swaminathan at that time was director of the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, which was in Delhi. So we arranged to meet, and that began what has become a 37-year period of very close friendship and professional association. Emma Swaminathan is one of the great people of this world. He's a person who was an outstanding scientist, the world's principal geneticist, but he cares about people. In 1972, Professor Swaminathan became the Director General of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, which had also been created by uh, Prime Minister Nehru back in the, uh, when India came independence. And together with C. Subramanian, was at that time the Minister of Agriculture, they launched what has since been come to be known as the Indian Green Revolution. The measurement of the success of this program is, I think, best measured by what has happened to Indian wheat. The Indian wheat harvest in 1965 was barely 8 million tons. In the year 2005, it was over 75 million tons. So that's almost a tenfold increase that they brought about by the introduction of these short straw wheats that had been developed in Mexico. Professor Swaminathan and I were able to develop a, a very extensive and diverse program of cooperation between IDRC and with, and, and the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. So that by 1975, IDRC was contributing pretty close to a million dollars a year to Indian Council of Agricultural Research, what were called the coordinated programs. We supported minor millets, such as Raggi at uh, the, the University of Andhra Pradesh Agricultural College in Coimbatore. We supported oil seeds research at GB Pant in Pantagar. We supported the root and tuber crops program at Trivandrum. 
which was in Tamil Nadu, as many of you know. And most, I think, one of the least noted, but one of the most impressive and the most productive programs was village aquaculture, which was in West Bengal and Orissa. By this time, Tony Dias had become the governor of West Bengal. Village aquaculture, or village polyculture as we call it, consists of selecting five or six different carp, spe carp species, every one of which has a different feeding habit. Some are bottom feeders, some are top feeders, some are phytoplankton, phytoplankton feeders, some are zooplankton feeders, some clean up the mess that others have left. And so we were able to stop village ponds with these. It was a, 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 a gentleman from the Inland Fisheries Research Council, Dr. Jingran, who was the person who designed this program. And it greatly increased the amount of fish available to small villages who had a pond anyway. And many of, it, it became a subject for the school. And many of the school children, managing aquaculture ponds is, is really uh, something kids love to do. They floated baskets of waste greens, and the carp came up and took them out of the basket. Little choppy, choppings of cabbage or whatever. And so this became a very, very big program. And since then, we have now expanded this into a, a program where Swan and is, I've worked with him in Pondicherry through his bio-religious program, which I shall mention in a moment. We had an annual, I went over to Delhi at least once a year, and I always went at the time that Swan and had his progress meeting with all his assistant directors general. And we reviewed what we'd done and how we could be more productive and more supportive in the future. Perhaps out of this, uh, the World Bank in 1971 helped to create what was called the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research. It was based upon the Rockefeller Ford program where they had created the International Rice Research Institute in, in, in the Philippines and the International Wheat and Maize Improvement Center in, in, in Mexico. And it was felt that expanding this program to build more specialist international agricultural research centers, which were centers both of research and of training, would help to improve agricultural production throughout the developing world. So I was invited to chair the group that set up what was called ICRISAT. That was the Institute for Crop Research in the Semi-Arid Tropics, which has its headquarters in Patanchero in Andhra Pradesh. It is now the world center for all dryland crops and all dryland agriculture, and has made remarkable progress. While I was there, I became quite familiar with a very impressive group of ladies who ran the nutrition part, the nutrition department at the Andhra Pradesh Agricultural University. They were having a fight with the vice chancellor because they wanted to take their work out into the villages to serve poor rural people. The university, typical of university administration, wanted to keep them all to give lectures to high class students, of course. Uh, and they said, no, we are going out there. So, but the university wouldn't give them any money, so we gave them money. And they did remarkable work on improving the nutritional standards, improving the healthcare standards, teaching women how to raise their children under more sanitary conditions, how to feed them more effectively. And I would suggest that this is far more effective program than having them lecture to high-priced students in, 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 uh, 
in the main university. But however, you, you may have different views on that, but I think these people did a remarkable job of work. I mentioned the Green Revolution that took place in India. Well, this had its origins for RICE and the International RICE Research Institute in the Philippines and for wheat and maize in, the, in Mexico. You may remember, those of you who are old enough to recall what went on in the world in the, the 19, early 1970s, that there was great concern that the so-called high-yielding varieties were not being adopted by small farmers. Now, the high-yielding varieties were produced by two agricultural research techniques. One of them shifted the biomass. That a plant can only produce so much material, and it either sticks it into its straw and leaves, or it sticks it into its head of grain. And so they had developed short straw rice genotypes, phenotypes, which had a large head of grain, and therefore they produced more edible grain than the traditional varieties. They'd also developed means of causing rice to mature much more rapidly. Traditional varieties or genotypes of rice took about 180 days after you planted the uh, little plantlet and until you were able to harvest a crop of rice. They managed to reduce this down to about 110, 120 days. So that meant that all the rice farmers could plant two crops a year. Now, the other constraint was that, of course, you had to irrigate these crops during the dry season. They did require a lot of fertilizer, and of course, because you were taking your second crop off during the monsoon, there was much more infestation and infection. So there was a higher demand for pesticides. So I looked at this. I, I, I was remembering my experience as a kid selling bread to poor people who were four years of age. And then with Maple Leaf Mills, where we got into operations research and systems analysis and, uh, and uh, marketing research, I said, well, how much time have they spent trying to find out about what the constraints of the poor farmer are? It's all very well to concentrate on plant breeding, but if you don't concern yourself with who's going to use the product of that plant breeding, what are their resources, what are their constraints, and most of all, what are their risks? Because remember, poor people, I learned this as a child of poor, poor people cannot afford to take any risk. They don't buy anything or they don't grow anything that they don't recognize as being good food. Therefore, you introduce a new variety to them, and they're not going to accept that because it's foreign. It's unusual. It's unfamiliar. So what we did, we set up an insurance fund. We selected a number of farmers in the Philippines, in the islands called Hilo Hilo, and we said, we will guarantee you that if you test these new high-yielding crops, and you don't get as big a yield as you got with your old traditional crop, we will give you whatever you earn during that year. Well, this provided the insurance, not like this stupid business that's going on now in, in Washington, <laughs> bailing out all these wealthy fellows who get being stupid. The, 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 these poor farmers couldn't afford the risk, and so we had to indemnify them against taking that risk. So, we set up a farming systems research program at Erie against substantial opposition from Erie's board who said, well, we're here to breed rice, we're not here to do farming systems. 
And so we did, we, because farmers understand that they are suspicious people, and if they bring, a, if they bring a, a, a Indian farmer, if you bring in another Indian, they wonder if he, if he or she is a tax collector. So we train their children to collect the data from their own fathers. In other words, how much, how did, what technologies did they use, what kind of varieties did they go, what were their resources, did they have access to irrigation, and, and so on and so forth. And out of this, we developed a methodology which began with these maybe dozen or so farmers in Ilo Ilo, but subsequently spread throughout the whole of Asia to include over 12 Asian countries and uh, hundreds of thousands of farmers. Well then, in the early 1980s, Professor Swaminathan was appointed Director General of the International Rice Research Institute, and from then we were able to expand this program because he was highly sympathetic to the small farmer. As you know, he's been chair of this committee studying why is it that so many small farmers are committing suicide in, in India, particularly in Maharashtra. And so we were able to expand this program again because of this personal friendship that we had. But it was he who made the decision. I, I said at the outset, how much had I learned about India and from India? It was from him that I learned so very, very much about what were the needs and the opportunities and the risks. In 1985, we suffered one of, I think, the greatest sadness we've ever known in our married life. Professor Valarati Nayodharma, who spent his last night on earth in our home, was killed in that wicked Air India explosion. That was, I was invited to write his obituary and I said, this is a bitter irony. There was a man who preached that technology should be used to help humanity, particularly those who are in greatest need, and he was killed by a, a vicious and disgusting and wicked misuse of technology. You know the number of poor Indians who were blown up, who had nothing whatever to do with politics. When we came home and learned about this, I know my wife was absolutely devastated because Nayudo was a member of our family, as is Swaminathan and as, our, as is NGK Nenu. I think of them more as brothers than I do as professional colleagues. And this was a, a very, very great and very bitter blow to us. In 1987, after I left IDRC, Professor Swaminathan had set up his research foundation, which had its headquarters in, in Chennai, and operates in Pondicherry, Tamil Nadu, and uh, more recently in uh, Kerala, invited me to become visiting professor and to work with his BioVillages program. The BioVillages program is something that he and I have discussed over many, many years because we both believe that people learn more from their own people than they learn from foreigners. The foreign expert, so-called, is often nothing of the kind. They arrive with a solution seeking a problem. They know nothing about the community. <laughs> they don't speak the language. And they're highly suspect and highly inefficient. I came across lots of them when I was with FAO. And so, in the BioVillagers program, what they have done is to train the brightest young people of a, of a rural community. They take them into the Swaminathan Foundation and they teach them what they need to know about the technologies, about 
marketing and about financial marketing, about financial support. Now, these young people, young men and young women, many of them are just late teens or early, or, or early 20s. They support the councils of women who run the bio-villages. Bio-villages are a group of villages that are in one particular region, and they are served from a bio-center where these young technical financial marketing advisors exist. The biocenter acts as a demonstration center. It has experimental plots where it shows, for example, in one in Pondicherry, they have developed a plot which is less than half a hectare, where a family of four or five can grow crops, a mixture of crops that provide every essential nutrient, including all the micronutrients, which is far more efficient than loading foods with synthetic chemicals. And so this is the technique that they've used. And they have trained the women in every group of women, every village, as you know, there is one woman who is recognized as a sort of leader. And so each woman, each village provides a leader to the central council and they decide, they decide what will be their priorities, what they want to grow, what are their markets. But one thing that we have done is provide every village with a computer. And the Swaminathan Foundation, as you know, India produces uh, a quarter of all the best pro uh, computer programmers in the world. And they have a, a really a, a, a whiz kid there who developed a program which is in every one of these village computers, which at any time of night or day, they can find out what is the price, the demand, for the commodities that they produce in the markets that they serve. That has been something that they've been completely cut off from in the past. Rural agriculture has not had access to the markets that it wants to serve. As I mentioned, the, we also use, the, the, the bio centers are used as demonstration centers and teaching centers. We also use the computers using computer graphics to teach women, many of whom can, can't read or write, but to teach them particular applicable technologies. For example, one, of, one group is selling vermiform comp compost fertilizer. And you show them on the computer graphic how to dig the pit, what to line it with, the, the vegetable, the, the, the uh, vegetative material, how to put in, how to select the worms and put them in, and so on and so on, and when to harvest that or when to sell it. And so the computer, these women, some of the younger people have become really very adept computer programmers. They produce their own diagrams now. And so these supposedly relatively illiterate people are quite perfectly capable, once you give them the opportunity, to do the things that they need to do for themselves. And they do do what they need. They don't do what some foreign expert that we sent from Canada tells them to do, in promise of money if they'll do it. So this has been, it is now expanding and it has been very, very successful. They also have uh, enabled them, we have, uh, there's one and other people have a, a fellow who got his degree in banking and he is in charge of producing microcredit facilities for these poor people. I mentioned that I have been for a number of years now visiting professor at the Food Research Institute which has enabled me to work with a number of rural poor people. One of them is run by the Karuna Trust, which is a religious 
Hindu religious organization run by a man, Dr. Sudarshan, who was a very eminent physician in Bangalore, but gave up his practice to go and provide health care to a whole group of tribal people in the PR Hills. I don't know how many of you know Kanataka well, but PR <coughs> Hills is uh, about 90 kilometers from Mysore. Uh, and uh, it's a huge natural forest of about 350 square kilometers inhabited by 80,000 members of the Soligas tribe who have lived off that forest for countless generations. They are, to my mind, the world's best example of biodiversity conservation. They are originally animists, and one of their gods is a tree. And that tree has told them you never harvest more than we can naturally recreate. So they never harvest any more than the natural rate of reproduction, which is far better than many of our so-called wizard agriculturalists and, and, and uh, forestry experts practice. So, Dr. Sudarshan went out there, first of all, to work with these poor women to provide health care. They had no maternity services, they had no antenatal, they had no postnatal. So he started there. And in a few moments I'll show you a slide of, uh, of his uh, maternity. I, I, I watched babies being born there. Now, he contends that gynecologists and obstetricians in North America have a woman lying down only for the convenience of the obstetrician, not for the best convenience of the woman. So all of his babies are delivered above a birthing stool. The women squat. And this is a much more natural position, I'm told. My wife knows more about this than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but he has far fewer miscarriages than I think are, are, are So he then went on to look at the incidence of leprosy, which when he was when there was over 18% of the people. It's now reduced to less than 1% by multiple antibiotics, and he has got some of his surgeon friends to come in and reconstruct the hands and feet of the lepers. This is really remarkable work. The, he came, he and I have been friends for a number of years, and he said to me one day, Joe, look, I've done a lot for the health of these people, but they need employment. How do we employ them? So we talked about um, I, I said to him, well, what do they eat? He said, well, what do you mean, what do they eat? I said, well, what are their favorite foods? What are the foods eaten? Because every food industry began in a woman's kitchen. All of the food and all the food processes that are used throughout the world began in a small kitchen in either uh, north of India or in Babylon or in Egypt or in the Middle East. And so I said, well, what do, they, what do they eat? What are the common dishes? Well, he told me, and they, most of the things they had came from the forest. So a group of my friends from CFTRI, the fruit and vegetable specialists, went through all of the products that were available there and determined which of them were produced in sufficient quantity and were amenable to being processed. And so we designed a factory, I got some money like getting blood out of a stone from cedar to, um, to provide funds to equip this factory, which the women built, and I'll show you how they built it in a moment, they built with their own hands out of local raw materials. And that factory now processes a whole range of natural products, including wild honey, it produces pickles of all kinds. And furthermore, as you know, most of our medicinal plants came from the tropical forests. They had, uh, Sudarshan has identified 16 plants, the extracts of which are manufactured by these women, 
and they're all being registered as Ayurvedic drugs. Now these are being registered by the Medical Research Council. They're not this quackery we see uh, put out in, in uh, the, our newspapers which tell us that there's a lot of nature drugs which don't work. Well, they don't work. I mean, they're, 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 just, uh, they're, they're just put up to, to make money. But these drugs have been confirmed by the Medical Research Council in India and they are genuine. So, at Mysore, at the Food Technology Training Center, we trained 40 of the tribal women to run this factory. And they run it, it's immaculate, because it's next door to the hospital and Sudarshan is a medical man. That factory is not quite the same standard as an operating theater, but my goodness, it certainly is a good deal cleaner than a good many food factories I visited in North America. These women run the place absolutely immaculate. They all, they insisted at their own volition that they would wear masks. They insist you wash your feet before you go in and out. They've covered all the windows with screens so that insects can't get in and out. And it's really quite remarkable what they've achieved. In the late 1990s, the Swaminathan Foundation decided to expand its bio-village program into the western Ghats of Kerala. As I'm sure many of you will know, the western Ghats has been classified by the United Nations as one of the six most prolific and diverse sources of biodiversity in the world. You have more plants more species of plants growing in the western Ghats than any, virtually anywhere else in the world. And so the opportunities there are absolutely enormous. And so we've been, I've been working with the people there. And one of their prime concerns is, again, elevating the standard of child nutrition. Because Kerala, the government of Kerala, many of you may not like the fact that it has been largely communist, but this has been a very benign government. It has been very much concerned with the welfare of its people. And they have supported very strongly, they are supporting the Swaminathan Research Program, which is uh, to help the rural children, particularly the tribal children, who, many of whom live in small tribal communities in the Western Yats Forest. And because the Swaminathan people don't have any pharmacological experience, I've been able to bring them together with the Karuna Trust, with the Sudarshan people, who now are helping them to identify what are true medicinal plants available in the Western Ghat, because I'm sure there are far more there than there are in the Beyond Hills, because of the immense diversity that exists in the Western Ghat. Then, we come to what is one of the most pathetic, but what I believe is one of the most encouraging programs that I've ever been involved in. As many of you know, when an Indian woman is raped, she was thrown out by her family or her husband. She is considered unclean. And she's thrown out onto the streets with absolutely no resources. So the Karuna Trust have set up hostels for these women. We're training them in small-scale horticulture, in handicrafts. First of all, they come in with tremendous trauma. I'll show you a picture of one of them shortly. I, I, I don't know, but... I'm sure rape must be a dreadfully traumatic experience for any woman. And these women suffer. They come in, I, I was there just a few months ago, and the latest one was brought in. She didn't remember who she was, she couldn't remember where she came from, she didn't know who her family was. And this was a young woman, I would say, from the looks of her, she was no more than 20. And she'd been raped. Now, why the fellows get away with it? 
I don't know, because I would perform a surgical operation on any one of them. <laughs> no, I'm, seriously, I think that, that they deserve to be punished, not the poor women. Anyway, we are now trying to provide for these women, provide a home for them, provide them with training so that they have some means of earning a living when they are eventually recovered. Lastly, it's always been my concern that uh, development agencies tend to work this one in its small corner, that one in, in its own. Several agencies I've worked with, the Swaminathan Foundation, the Karuna Trust, the Food Research Institute of Mysore, then with the Hindustan Lever people who have a big program in Maharashtra, and also with the Tata um, uh, Radis, which is the agricultural arm, all are working with small scale agriculture in rural areas. Yet they're all working independently. So I suggested to each of them, why don't you come together? Each of you has a particular expertise. Why don't you come together? Because working collectively, without losing your individual identity, you can achieve far more than all working separately. And so now, under the chairmanship of Professor Swaminathan, we have representatives from the Karuna Trust, from Hindustan Liva, from the Tata Group, from um, the uh, uh, from UNICEF, and from several other organizations, from this one and that group. All working together, the emphasis by the Swaminathan people has been in Pondicherry and Tamil Nadu, the, con the emphasis, and in Kerala, the emphasis by the Karuna Trust has been in Karnataka. The emphasis by Hindustan Liva has been in Maharashtra, and, but they're all working with poor rural people to improve their nutrition well-being. Well, I think I'd just very briefly like to show you a few slides about uh, what, to illustrate some of the things I've been talking about then. This is how the factory was built by the local women. This is the process, during the process of building. This little pit here is a, an Indian innovation which uses porous bricks which they cover with water and as you know, refrigeration is based upon evaporative cooling. And as the water evaporates, you bring down the inside of that pit by 15 degrees centigrade. So that is the finished factory, and they store their raw materials, their perishable raw materials, until they're ready to process them in that pit, which is 15 degrees centigrade lower than the outside temperature. This is the inside of the factory. Uh, these are the various equipment that's, that's used. We have a training program for young women in textile design and textile uh, making a garment out of textile. Oh, this is. I watched that baby being born. This is the lying in room for the women after they've just given birth. And uh, the other thing I should have mentioned is that uh, Saga, uh, Sudarshan has created an eye hospital because many of the people suffer from eye dysfunctions. Now, this is the, the I'm sorry, this got out of water. This is where the girls learn how to put the, the, uh, the garments that they've designed, make them, in, uh, at least the fabrics they design, how they make them into garments. We, we've got a, a room for a little sewing machines. These are some of the products. That was the, Indian, the Canadian High Commissioner who officially opened the factory in uh, 
1943. And these are just a series of the products that we make bottle cordials and they make uh, uh, purees and they make pickles and also they make extracts of uh, medicinal plants. This is one of the bedrooms of the, of the hostel. These are two of the women who were raped and were brought in homeless. That poor woman is one who completely lost, she didn't know who she was, she didn't know her ma uh, uh, who her family was, but she, she eventually said to me, I am suffering, but I am going to get better. And I found this deeply moving. This is the group, this is the, uh, the total number of women that they had in the one hostel. They're now building a much bigger one that will hold many, many more with money that the uh, Ratan Tata has offered to give them. This is a woman who had just come in and again was totally disoriented, who didn't know who she was or what she was doing. Well, just to sum up, during my 59 visits to India over 45 years, and after having given many lectures and made many recommendations there, I can honestly state that I have learned far more than I have ever taught and far more than I have ever recommended. And my greatest reward has been the many, many very dear friends that I've made in India. I can honestly say I have more dear, close friends in India than I have in Canada. Watching over the past 40 odd years, India's economic and industrial progress, I'm immensely gratified by what has taken place. But my one regret as a disciple of Gandhi, as I may presume to say so, is that India's rising middle class seems more influenced by Americans than it is by Mahatma Gandhi, who I believe was the greatest man who lived in the last millennium. And I truly believe that when India comes back to the Nehru philosophy of combining technological genius with compassion for the poor, as it was preached by Mahatma Gandhi, it will not only be the biggest, but the world's greatest democracy. Because as Gandhiji so widely reminds us, our planet's resources are sufficient to satisfy everybody's need, but not everybody's greed. Thank you. Dr. can you take a few questions? I'm going to take a few questions. So there are questions from Yes, sir. Near the very end, you said you encouraged these different groups who were working and had expertise in individual areas to come together. What is, is there an outcome from that whereby the benefit has uh, expanded? Well, I should have said I this only started rather less than a year ago. So we have hopes they all contend that they are going to cooperate. We already have the benefit of the Karuna Trust of Dr. Sudarshan helping the Swaminathan people in identifying those crops, those medicinal plants, those plants that are believed to be medicinal in Kerala, in the West of Ghats, of identifying those by pharmacological experience. It's going to take time because, as you know, everybody's very really busy and they all go about their own business. But I do believe that Swaminathan is very, con is very much uh, um, convinced of the importance of this. And he is now, of course, a member of the Upper House of uh, Parliament in, in Delhi. And so he's trying to get support from 
government sources to support this integrated program of, um, of rural child malnutrition alleviation. But it, it will take time. I, I, I don't suppose I shall live to see the eventual output, output of it, but uh, I have every confidence it will succeed. I hope you certainly do. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned earlier on about the first green revolution. Mm -hmm. I understand uh, from other authors that were being studied this that the smaller farmers went bankrupt during the first green revolution because of the very use of the short straw uh, thing because they could not afford the herbicide and the fertilizers and therefore the wheat began to grow higher than the in the, in the game plan itself. Uh, and therefore they lost all the crops. Now recently, having said that, recently I'm told there have been an edict by the Indian government that the farmers cannot use their own grains 